Come on, everybody, just say that. 20 more seconds. say hallelujah say it again hallelujah for those of you who are not aware the Bible specifically says that hallelujah is the highest form of praise so if you can't think of anything to say if you don't even want to say thank you or you don't know the latest church lingo or song or you don't know how to speak in tongues or you don't know how to, all, all you have to do is just say hallelujah hallelujah and, and it translates into heaven as the highest form of praise. Come on, practice it. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, now, could you imagine saying that word and actually being grateful at the same time? The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. So could you imagine using God's love language and then actually meaning it that you would invoke power from heaven and and proactively cause God to respond to what it is that you need. Somebody say hallelujah. Oh, we give God all the glory. We give God all the praise. You know, I was on my way uh, to church this morning and um, Nick was listening to something on the radio and, and I was just listening to it and it was a program. And you got all of these people in America uh, talking about impeach the president this and, and 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 do this and do that and 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 one of the guys said and I want want to say this to you because as Martin Luther King's birthday uh, is tomorrow I want to educate you on something um, that even if you want him impeached whatever your political views are you don't have the votes in the house to do it okay there are more Republican senators uh, congressmen than there are democratic okay and if you were to get the Congress to do it you still don't have the votes in the house okay so you 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 can't do it in the in the Congress you can't do it in the Senate but where you can do it is you have the vote at the midterm election you see everybody's waiting on politicians to do one thing but what you don't do is you don't vote the politicians in that will do the thing you want done so you sit back and let everybody else do the voting and then you do all the complaining. Touch your name and say vote. One of the things I've, I've tried to do since I've been leading this church is not to tell you what political party to choose because I have friends who are both Democrats and Republicans. And let me tell you, I agree with both sides. There are some things that I agree with Democrats on and there are some things I agree with Republicans on and if you are so narrow-minded that you only vote one way, I feel sorry for you because you've got to have an interest beyond where you were raised and how you grew up. Yeah. Amen, somebody. <clears throat> and so I've tried to do that and I'm going to continue to do that. I've got three people here today uh, that are coming and, and I always acknowledge people uh, who have enough courage to come and say, I want to serve. Somebody say amen. Uh, Mr. Richard Bonton, uh, he's a Democratic candidate for step state rep um, of uh, 142. Raise your hand, sir, so that can see you. Praise God for him. Come on and praise God for him. Um, we've got Mrs. Mukherjee. She is a Democratic candidate for judge of the 269th uh, Civil District Court. Will you raise your hand so they can see you? Come on and praise God for her. And then last, Mr. Chris. Is it Agra? Did I say it right? All right, Agra, Democratic candidate for judge of Harris County criminal court 15. Come on and praise God for him. I'm not telling you who to vote for, but I do know the next time your nephew or your cousin or your brother goes down to, to the jail, he need to see somebody on the other side of the bench that look like him. You keep voting in people who ain't never been down your streets and never had your problems. That's why they throw your sons away and never think about it because they have no idea what it's like to grow up on the streets you grew up on. I ain't talking about nobody. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. So they'll be out in the foyer and they'll be greeting you. Uh, but if, nobody, if no other church in this city does it, 
I want you, uh, whenever we vote, for whatever it is, if we're voting for the, the, the tallest dog on Main Street, go vote. Otherwise, don't complain to him about he could have been taller. I wish we had a taller dog. You don't have no reason. If you, if you don't vote, you can't say nothing. Amen? I want to continue in our uh, talks about uh, the year of elevation. Amen? Uh, how many of y'all feel like you're elevating this year? Come on and praise God. Make Hallelujah. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse number 6. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse number 6. If you got it, say, I got it. If you're still looking, hold up. Say, hold up. If you don't know where to look, look at the screen. I ain't going to have it up there in a minute. It's not up there yet? Oh, it's coming, I think. It's up there. All right. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in here, thinking David would come in. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. And David said, On that day, whoever goes into the gutter, touch your name and say, I come from the gutter. Whoever goes up to the gutter and kills the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David, so he shall be chief and captain. See, did you not know that sometimes the gutter is the promotion? Y'all missed in this sermon already. Most people think that going up is the promotion. He says if you go down, I'll promote you. Somebody said, you got to go down. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built around it and inward. And David went on and grew great in the Lord. And the host was with him. I want to preach on this subject. And I need you to help me help somebody. Look at him and say, neighbor, pastor wants to talk about making ends meet. Amen. Come on, touch everybody on your way down to your seat and say, this year I'm going to make ends meet. Hallelujah, in the name of the Lord. Um, how many of y'all grew up in an environment where you heard your mama say something like this? Boy, I ain't got no money. I'm just barely. Oh, y'all mama knew my mama. I, could t I knew this was going to be a good sermon already. Maybe you heard it somewhere. Or maybe, you know what? You don't have to go back to your mama to find somebody who said that. You have <laughs> said on more than one occasion to your children, I ain't got no money. Boy, I'm barely making ends meet. It's a colloquialism that is used uh, in the homes of those of the African-American diaspora uh, where we uh, pontificate about our plight as human beings in that reality is, is we broke. Uh, we ain't got no money, dog. We struggling out here in these streets, amen? And uh, we're, we're overworked and underpaid. And um, I, I used to subscribe to that ideology until I found out uh, that faith uh, will feel where fault is faulty. Uh, that you can have enough faith in God that your faith in God will override your situation. Um, you, you may not be where you want to be, but is there anybody that can just thank God for about two seconds that you're not where you used to be? Mm -hmm. You know that you are much further alone than you deserve to be. Some of y'all don't have an education and you still got employment. You didn't graduate from college, and yet you get paid more than some people who do. You know, there are some felons in here today. They should have never hired you, but somehow God made a way out of no way. And, and, and I'm just grateful today. I'm grateful that, that God will look beyond our faults and that he will supply um, the accoutrements of our needs. Uh, when, I, when I read this text, by the time we get to this text, David has already been the king of Judah for seven years. 
Now, most people don't know this, that David, uh, once he was anointed, uh, he went back to the field. Uh, and then when he was anointed king, he was only anointed king over a small province, one tribe of Israel. For those of you all who are not aware, there are actually 12 tribes. So in other words, David was only king over one twelfth of the whole of Israel. He was, not, he was not the king of all of Israel. He would not later become the king over all of Israel until after seven years. And do know that the reason why it took seven years is that Saul had another son, Ishbosheth, who, was, uh, who had set up an opposition party. Uh, in other words, uh, David was the king uh, of, the, of the south where Judah was, and Ishbosheth was the king of the north. And, and David uh, only had this small proverb, uh, province, and, and Saul's other son had set up an opposition because the truth is, and, and, and it is true according to the physicality of it, uh, Saul's son should have been next in line to be king. Right. Now, I mean, if you know that sometimes God will do something divine that will overlook the humane that even though the person who is next in line should deserve it, that if God gets involved, God will put you above somebody who deserves a position you don't even qualify for. David is not Saul's son. David is not in the Saul uh, heritage. He's, he's not even related to Saul, but, but God wanted him so bad and he was anointed to do the job that he didn't have to be related to be relatable. And so God gives the job to Daniel, uh, to, to David, and David is the king uh, over Judah, and, and now the ends are about to meet because he, the Bible says that he reigns over Israel for 40 years, yeah. which means then he must have reigned over all of Israel for 33 years and only reigned over Judah for seven years because 33 plus 7 equals 40. So now we're able to differentiate how long he was over each one of these kingdoms, but, but, but the ends had not yet met. And so now David is in a place of frustration because he is anointed uh, for the whole thing, but he only currently has a part of the thing. Now, you must also understand that David was anointed three times. That most people think that when he was anointed by Samuel at home, then that anointing made him king over all of Israel. No, the Bible says that he was first anointed at home. And then you find out that he was anointed by the men of Hebron. And then the third time he was anointed was in our text because here was the first thing I want you to know. Just because you're anointed in one area doesn't mean you're anointed in every area. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm anointed. But you have to also be called to the anointing. In other words, you, David could not suggest that because he was anointed king of Judah, that meant he had carte blanche in, in all of the other tribes. He was anointed in one area, and then God had to come back and anoint him for another area, and then God had to come back and anoint him for another area. Stop thinking that your anointing is universal. <laughs> that because you're anointed to sing, now that means you're anointed to be a deacon. That is not the same thing. That just because, just because you went to a place and you gave a speech and everybody clapped your hands, their hands and said, you spoke good, that doesn't mean you're anointed to be a preacher. Amen, somebody. And just because you're anointed to be a preacher, let me go further, that some, the Bible says that he gave us five gifts, five-fold ministries, some to be preachers, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, because everybody is not even called to pastor. Y'all not going to say amen. Touch your neighbor and say, you got to find your anointing. You will never be successful in an area you have not been anointed to succeed. The reason why most people are struggling in life is because somebody told them they ought to do it and they went into an area without an anointing. But I came to tell somebody in this place today, if you ever find out where you were anointed, if you ever find out what God anointed you to do, you will be king. And don't be mad because you're only king of Judah. Because if you're faithful over Judah, then possibly God will make you ruler over much. Touch your neighbor and say, God will do it. I want you to learn to be faithful where you are. Most people never get elevated is because they never become grateful for their current position. They're always looking for where they're going to go next, but God says, I don't want you focusing on what's next. Can you give your now all you have? God, help me in this church today. Slap your neighbor and say, give your now all you have. Stop looking for a house until you clean up the apartment. Don't ask God for a Bentley until you take that Lexus or that Toyota to the car wash. Don't ask God for a Bentley until you put gas in your Ford. You got to learn to be grateful for where you are and take care of what you currently have. But I don't know who I'm talking to. 
You may not have all of Israel, but you might just have Judah, and I came to put you on notice, you've been anointed for it. Touch your name and say, I've been anointed for it. That, 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 do you know that the things that you have, that you're the only one anointed to do it? That somebody else can come in your house, they'll look at your kids and your husband and your income one time, and they'll think that they can make it with what you have, and they'll look at how you had to struggle to make it on what you have, and they'll give you everything back that they thought they wanted from you. Why? Because you're anointed to do it. Somebody can take your job, but you're the one anointed to do it, so you may not be there, but they'll lose it in three days. Why? Because they're not anointed to do it. You can have this church, but you'll kill it because I'm the only one anointed to do it. People will always look at you and think, they can do what you do, but touch your neighbor and say, I'm anointed to do this. Don't look up here and say, oh, I can preach like that, or if I was up there, I could do that, or I could have this church, or I would have this many members. You might be able to in Mississippi, but you can't do it on rank and roll because I'm the only one anointed to do it here. I want to know, is there anybody here that knows that you're only anointed where you are anointed to do it? Touch your neighbor and say, you might be able to do it over there, but you can't do it here. And I prophesy and speak into your life right now that you're going to learn that you got to have enough confidence to know that can't nobody take your stuff because you're anointed to do it. And the same is true on the other side, that as they are not anointed to do what you can do, you are not anointed to do. Touch your name and say, play your role, cuz. Anointings are not transferable into all areas. When God first anointed David to be king over Israel, it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense for God to go get a teenage boy who has no political experience. He has never been. Listen, he goes all the way to president. He, he, he could at least start out as a community activist. He could have started out uh, as, as a junior, uh, um, a person to a, a, a candidate. Uh, he, could have, he could have been a, a senator. He could have been a, a prime minister. God took him from the field all the way to the top. But, but God doesn't shock treat him because he anoints him and then he sends him back to where he came from because sometimes what most people don't understand is they want God to bless them swiftly, but you can get lost in the translation. You can get lost in the transition because where you are going, that's why the Bible says the steps are ordered by the Lord. You, you got to take the steps. You can't, you can't see, see 2017 was your steps. And if, if you were, if you were good on the steps, now you are ready for the year of elevation. But, but you couldn't skip last year, uh, the year of release and then walk into the year of elevation because last year got you prepared for this year. Or, or do I have anybody here today? And so here, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that God goes and anoints David. And I, and I tell you right now, off the top of my head, it doesn't make sense. God go get somebody who has no experience. He goes and gets somebody that if you were anointing him, you would not anoint him. David, David was in the field. He was a teenager and his father had all of these sons lined up and David wasn't even at the lineup. He was out there in the field somewhere tending sheep. It didn't make sense. But I'm going to tell you something. In this next season, God's going to anoint people and it ain't going to make sense to others. It's not going to make sense to others. But, but, but here's what God will do. God will pursue you before he proves you. He will pursue you before he proves you. And, and for those of y'all who are waiting on it to make sense for God to anoint you, then you're going to miss the whole chapter of your life because God is not waiting on you to be sin free. And God is not waiting on you to get over your problems. And God is not waiting on you to stop drinking. I'm going to get to your sin in a minute. And God ain't waiting on you to decide that you ain't going to smoke weed no more. And God ain't waiting on you to get too tired to go to the club. Most people try to act like they deliver from the club. You just got tired of it and found out what nothing there. You didn't get tired of it. You just got tired of coming up empty. Holler at your boy. But God is not waiting on you to get done with all of that. How many of you know that God will still anoint you when you're still coming in here after not going to sleep all night long? That's why y'all ain't said amen yet because you ain't went to sleep from yesterday. But I come to bind that curse over you right now and let you know that even though you're not perfect, God will still anoint you. That even though you've got issues, God will still anoint you. And drunk, you still anointed. And, and, and still cussing, you'll anointed. And, and, and still having a bad attitude, you're anointed. But what God is trying to do over your life is to get you from your field and get you to your castle. But there is some transition that takes place first. That's why God will always give you a small thing to be faithful over. Before he makes you ruler over much, God will pursue you before he proves you. And it took a long time for David's anointing to make sense. I can't tell you right now that what God is getting ready to do in your life, it ain't going to make sense. And people are going to look at you and be like, oh, my God, how, why, why her? Why him? That doesn't make sense. You know, a lot of people look at you and they think they deserve your space. 
They think they deserve it. They think they deserve it. They look at you and say, I'm, I'm more educated. I'm more qualified, but you're not anointed for this. Come on, touch your name and say, for this, for this, for this. On the contrary, though, Saul, his anointing made sense. He was head and shoulders above everybody else, came from an aristocratic family. His father was rich, owned a whole slew of donkeys. It made sense to anoint Saul. But why is it that when Saul had the kingdom, it was in decline, the one that made sense? And when David got the kingdom, it advanced the one that didn't make sense. The one that was handsome and tall and strong and rich, when he got it, he ran it into the ground. As a matter of fact, if you read the Bible carefully, the Bible specifically says that when Saul was over uh, uh, the kingdom of Israel, it was in decline. Are y'all with me so far? And by the time Saul was done with the kingdom, it had been divided. There was a political war. The Democrats were against the Republicans. The kingdom could not advance. Why? Because a house divided against itself. I ain't trying to make you shout. I'm trying to make you learn. Shall surely fall. That's why you got to be careful that you can never advance with somebody you are at odds with. Oh, God, help me in this place today. You will never advance with something when you are hooked up with somebody you're at odds with. I say to every married couple, if your money ain't together, no wonder it's divided. Oh, God, help me in this place today. If y'all are not together on how you're going to raise the children, no wonder they're off the chain. Wherever you are divided in your house, watch this, division. That's why when you roll dice, there have to be two because wherever there's two visions, there is division. God, help me in this church. Wherever there's two, that's why in your house, you're going to have to decide, are you going to run the house or your wife going to run it? Because anything that has two heads is deformed. And so if she's the head and you're the head, you got a deformed house. No wonder y'all can't tell what direction you're going. God, this, I, I knew it was going to be a hard sermon, but I don't care. Come on and say amen. It, it ain't my fault. Touch your name and say it ain't his fault. You married her. All right. So the Bible lets us know that Saul comes from a rich family. He's head and shoulders above everybody else. Sometimes, whether or not you made a good decision doesn't reveal itself until after you made the choice. You would think that picking this tall, handsome, rich dude would be the answer, not this small, short, skinny, scrawny, sheep-smelling dude who would have thought that he was going to be the greatest king Israel ever saw. But sometimes your decisions don't make sense until after you make them. That's why I want you to stop beating yourself up talking about I made a bad choice. Sometimes you don't know until after you choose. Do you know, let me, if you ever made a bad decision, raise your hand. Let me tell you your advantage. At least you made a choice. Can you just, can you just praise God for that? At least you made a choice. There are some people who never make bad decisions because they never choose anything. They just sit back and just hope things happen and wish things happen. You can't advance until you make a choice. God made a choice. And to us, and, and, and I know we got the Bible right now, so we're just so holy right now, so we just agree with God. But if you were alive then and you would have saw Saul and you would have saw David and you would have saw that God picked David, you would have thought God had lost his mind. You would have said, Samuel, you ain't anointed. You are not a real preacher. You don't know what's going on. You have anointed the wrong person. We have already picked this king. We want this king. You remember Saul was the first chosen king. The people picked him. This was their decision. And now they go and have to deal with somebody they did not choose. Are you mature enough to deal with somebody you didn't pick? Are you mature enough to deal with decisions you don't agree with? Are you mature enough to deal with things that you would not have picked for yourself? The only way you can be king, the only way you can advance is to have the maturity to deal with things that you would not have chosen. Oh, God, help me in this cold church today. So if I want to show you how to make ends meet, the first thing that we see David do is once he has anointed king over all of Israel, the first thing we see them do is they have an inauguration service. And that's customary, right? So they have an inauguration service, and, and they have an inauguration, and everybody comes, and they're, they're shouting and screaming for David. And, and, and before Saul is dead, you got to hear the women coming out talking about Saul has killed his thousands.
And David has killed his tens of thousands, and, and Saul is upset, and he wants to kill David. And, and now they get to the inauguration, and David is about to be installed as king. But let me show you something that David does that I hope will help you. He's installed as king, and the first thing he does is the first thing you must do in order to make ends meet. He did not have a hangover at his party. He did not have position hangover. He did not go around telling everybody he was king. The first thing he did was create a strategy. This is the first thing that you're going to have to do in 2018. Touch three people and say, establish a strategy. The very first thing he does is establish a strategy. And the first thing he does is he says, I tell you what, I'm going to change the capital city. I'm going to change the capital city from Judah where I am, and I'm going to change it to Jerusalem. And it is amazing that he is in the will of God not knowing because the Bible says that when God comes back, he's coming back to establish his kingdom in the new Jerusalem. Oh, God, help me in this place. No wonder it's called the city of David. So David comes and establishes a kingdom and establishes his headquarters right in the city of Jerusalem. He, but watch this. This is the first thing you must understand. He establishes Jerusalem, but it belongs currently to the Jebusites, which means in order to establish it, he has to invade it. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. The problem with most people, especially young people, is they're waiting on somebody to give them something. <laughs> waiting on somebody to give them something. Waiting on somebody to give you an apology. Waiting on somebody to tell you why they mistreated you. Waiting on somebody to give you an opportunity. Now, I hear people say it all the time. I'm just waiting on somebody to give me a break. Ain't nobody gonna give you a break. You gotta go take a break. <laughs> Touch your name and say, invade it. I'm telling you right now, you're in the year where you're going to have to invade it. You're going to have to see a room you want to get in and not look for an invitation and just invade it. And sometimes the safest way to invade a room that you haven't been invited into is to serve somebody who's in the room so that the person you say, God, so that the person you serve will invite you in the room. Slap somebody say, invade it. When he was anointed, he does not get to having a party about the fact that he is king. He just establishes a strategy. I wish I could come and ask every one of you today, what is your strategy? And if you cannot answer me in 15 seconds, it's because you don't have one. Most of us are living this year the same way we lived last year, hoping stuff happened. What's your strategy? What is your mile marker? By March, where should you be? By June, how much money will you have in the bank? By October, where should you be? Not just hoping and wishing and hoping and wishing and hoping and wishing and wishing and hoping. Where are you going to be by next week? What's going to happen on the 18th of February? Where will you be by the 13th of March? Where will you be by April? And where will you be by May? How many friends will you have by June? And how many people will you have cut off by July? How many vacations would you have taken by June? How many conferences will you be have attended by the time December comes? Most of us don't know because we respond to life's commercials. You don't have a plan, you just respond to stimuli. You don't know how much money you're going to spend. It just depends on how many sales they have. You don't know how much money you're going to save. By, oh, by the way, I know y'all aren't going to say, man, touch on them and say, and he don't care. Uh, I, how much money will you save this year? Because if you don't know, you ain't going to save none. I would, I would that you would put $10 a week up and have $520 at the end of the year, then not do anything. You save $520 a year for 10 years, now you got $5,200. You put that in a Roth IRA for the next 30 years, and now you can retire with four dollars $500,000. But if you don't have, that's what $10 a week could do for you. And we just sit back and just wait on somebody to die so we can get insurance policy. Or, or we go to the gas station and don't act like you don't pay the lottery. Don't act like you don't. Be looking around, making sure you don't see no church folk. I'm tell y'all right now, I wouldn't worry about no church folk. If I played the lottery, I'd play it at church. Now, I just don't play, but I wouldn't worry about them people. If you're going to play, go up in there with some boldness. 
That's why you can't win. You ain't got no good vibes. <laughs> and that's trying to hide and you ain't speaking to the universe. <laughs> Better go in there and win. Touch your name and say, go in there and win. And I'd heard this people talk. This, they, they said this in the church I came to. They say, if you win the lottery, don't tithe because God don't want that money. <laughs> Let me tell y'all something. You win that lottery, tithe. Touch your neighbor and say, tithe. <laughs> we'll pray about it. <laughs> Wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. That's the most ridiculous argument I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Everybody shout strategy. When David decided to take the city, he had to have a strategy. You can't take a city without a strategy. I don't know what your city is. I don't know what your city is. Maybe your city is your family, but you won't have a successful family without a strategy. You won't have a successful marriage without a strategy. A strategy for marriage is not getting rings and buying a dress and spending 25,000 on a marriage. A strategy is, what are we going to do when we come together? If you can't find a strategy for that person, don't promote them. Don't promote them to husband. Don't promote them to wife because they're cute or because they're sexy. Promote them because they got a strategy. Lord, help me in this place. The reason why most marriages don't survive is because they don't have a strategy. You got to have a strategy. I'm talking about down to the letter. You got to have a strategy. You got to write down what words you will use when y'all mad at each other. You got to have a strategy. So you ought to already write down, okay, if I get mad at you, I can't call you this word. But, and, 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 and remind, my wife and I right now have a brown paper bag at home. Inside of that brown paper bag are a few things that are part of our strategy. The first thing that's in the brown paper bag is a ribbon that's tied. That means we made a knot we can't break. The second thing we have in there is a, is a sponge. How many of y'all wash your own dishes and they got that, that sponge that's yellow on one side and... Oh, yeah, y'all. Yeah, I love y'all. We, we put that in there. Why? To show us that marriage has a rough side and a smooth side. Then we got another thing in there. We got two packages of sugar. And on the sugar, we wrote down what we call each other when we get mad at each other. That, that, y'all laughing, but that's our strategy. So that's why she ain't never been a B word. That's why I ain't never been this and that. Why? Because we got a strategy. If you don't have a strategy, you'll call them what you think at that moment. Y'all gonna make me go to sleep. This sermon about to be over five minutes. I can't wait till the other people get here because y'all tripping today. And you gotta have a strategy. Touch your neighbor and say, have a strategy. See, this is why it is hard to educate Christians because you can shout them and make them think that a miracle is going to meet them in the middle of the water. But whenever you tell them they got to do something, they go to bed. David, when he got ready to take the city, the walls did not fall down like they did at Jericho because God says, I will never give you a miracle where you can use your mind. Touch your neighbor and say, wake up. Sometimes the walls fall down, but sometimes you got to use your head. David says, I'm going to take the city. But if he was waiting on God to part the waters like he was, the Red Sea like he did Moses, he'd be still waiting there right now. If he was waiting on God to make the walls fall down at Jericho like he did, he would be waiting there right now. God says, I don't perform miracles where you can use your mind. The reason why I parted the waters is because no matter of brain power can part the waters. The reason why I made the walls fall down is no matter of brain power can make the wall fall down. But David, if you're going to be king, I cannot put somebody in office who needs a miracle for everything. I need somebody who needs to know how to use their brain. You waiting on a miracle and God's waiting on your mind. God says, David, take the stronghold, but you're gonna have to use your head. Ain't no miracle coming. I came to tell some of y'all, you ain't getting a miracle. You're not getting a miracle. Ain't no money falling from heaven. Ain't no check gonna be in the mail tomorrow. The Bible doesn't say he gives us money. The Bible says he gives us the idea to create wealth. And we have spoiled all of you Christians, making you think that there's going to be a miracle around every corner. You got to do something. Touch your name and say, you got to do something. 
The politicians that are here today, they couldn't have stayed at home and just hope you voted for them. They had to come and make their name known. They had to do something. They don't go to this church, but they had to come to this church. They're going to have to shake your hands. Why? Because ain't no miracle going to get them in office. You got to do something. But you got to have a strategy. Otherwise, what you do will be futile. David says, I tell you what, um, I don't know how we're going to get in there. And this is something most people don't want to do. This is why they never go up. He says, whoever comes up with a strategy that gets us in the stronghold, I will promote them to captain and chief. He doesn't have the crab in the barrel syndrome. He's willing to elevate somebody with him. He says, whoever will do it, I'll elevate them. Oh, and by the way, you won't find out from this text, you got to go to 1 Chronicles to find out that there was a young man named Joab who so happens to be the nephew of David was the one who came up with the strategy. What I love about David is that David doesn't just um, elevate him because he's his nephew. He anoints him because he has a strategy. The other problem that most of us will have in the year elevation is that God will elevate you and you will elevate people just because y'all related. And I want to warn you about elevating folk just because they're your cousin. Just because they're your cousin don't mean they could be your manager. And just because they're your cousin don't mean they need to be managing your books. How in the world are they going to manage your business books and they can't balance their own checkbook? Stop putting people who don't have money over your money. That includes you. <laughs> Lord Jesus, that includes you. That means that if you're not accustomed to having money, you don't know what to do with it, you need to go hire a financial planner and pay them one, two, three, four, five percent on how to handle your 97 percent as opposed to leaving the 100 percent in your hands and you don't have a strategy for it. A lot of people ask God for money. Okay, God gives you a million dollars a day. I got a question. What's your strategy? Because if you don't have a strategy, here's it, what I promise you. Human nature will allow you to spin your way back to your current position. And there ain't nothing worse than having more stuff on the same income. Can you imagine going and buying a house and then going back and making the money you make and having to pay the taxes on your current income? Because most people think, oh, I'm, I can afford the mortgage, yeah, but after the mortgage, there are taxes, there are repairs. Flood insurance. Wind damage, shingles. You don't want a blue tarp on your house for the next 10 years, do you? because you bought a house you couldn't afford, I'd rather you go buy a, ho a house that you can afford rather than go buy one you cannot, and everybody who walks in and know, mm, they can't afford this. <laughs> they ain't painted this year. Well, I love y'all quiet. This means I'm wearing y'all out. Good job, Keon. Somebody say strategy. He says, he says, if you can go in there, I'll promote you. He goes in. And this is what they start, the Bible, I, I can imagine this, the Bible doesn't say it specifically, the Bible says they scorn them, but I can see that they're on top of the wall, nobody's ever gotten in the wall, so they're looking at them, talking about, you're not going to get in here, here's what the Bible says, man, the lame and the blind, you, you just lame and blind. You, 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 David, you couldn't get in here anyway, you were a mistake. <laughs> you should have never been anointed in the first place. We don't know what God, your God, was thinking by picking you over Saul, that's why we don't serve him, because we don't agree with his choices. You know, some people don't agree with God and think that God ought to agree. So we, don't, we don't know what God did by anointing you, but you're not going to get in here. David does something, and here's a part of his strategy. He does not attack them where they are fortified. He does not attack them in the strength. He says, will somebody come up with a strategy? Joab says, I tell you what, let's go through the gutter because nobody ever looks low for a dangerous person. <laughs> when, whenever somebody's afraid that somebody's gonna take their position, they always look up. Whenever, whenever somebody's afraid that the, whoever the next person in line is gonna take their position, or take, they're always looking up. But the person who helped them in was willing to crawl in the gutter. 
I'm telling you, this next season of elevation is going to people who don't mind getting in the gutter. Next season is going to people who don't mind getting dirty. This next season is going to people who don't mind rolling up their sleeves and, and, and shaking hands with homeless people and feeding the hungry and, and, and going to convalescent homes and, 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 and serving. The Bible says what you've done to the least of them. God help me in this church. You have done also unto me. Touch your neighbor and say, you got to have a strategy. They are arguing with David. They are scorning him, but he does not respond to them because he has a strategy. Let me tell you, whenever I see people in long arguments, I know that they don't have a strategy. Do you know the devil, his strategy is to frustrate you. And if you don't have a strategy, then your strategy would be to respond to him. So if you got a strategy, then you can focus on your strategy and not focus on who's talking about you. And if you have a strategy, you wouldn't spend nine hours on Facebook and Instagram trying to find out who's trying to send a subliminal message behind their post. And we can see you responding to them. In 2017, I'm cutting everybody off. Everybody say strategy. You have to have a strategy. What's your plan? Where is it? Oh, it's in your head. That's why you can't get it done, because so is everything else. You got to write it down. You got to get the strategy out of your head because not only is the strategy in your head, but your depression is in there and your frustration is in there. And now your depression and frustration is competing for brain activity. And so now sometimes, that's why sometimes you're ready to go conquer the world and then sometimes you can't get out of the bed. Sometimes you're ready to go start a company and you'll work good for three and four, five weeks and then sometimes you lay it aside, you know why? Because you got to get the strategy out of your head and you got to get it on paper and you got to promote somebody else to help you accomplish your strategy. Can you find a Joab who don't mind crawling through the gutter or does everybody in your circle got to be cute and everybody in your circle got to have money and everybody in your circle got to be somebody and everybody in your circle got to have long hair and everybody got to be light-skinned did it. Because we the cute click. You know, most people pick their friends and they pick their friends that look like them and act like them and make the same decisions as them and that's called a circle. <laughs> Which is why you keep going in it. You need somebody who doesn't look like you so you can make some sharp turns and some angles. You need somebody who will look at you and say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. You need to make a different decision. You are dumb. You are stupid. You need somebody in your life who will offend you. Stop getting everybody who will agree with you. Boy, I know this is a good sermon because y'all look like y'all, y'all look like y'all just was in the ring with Floyd Mayweather at the last fight. Just looking like Fred Seven time. Elizabeth, I'm coming. Y'all just look toe up. I'm telling the year of elevation, everything ain't going to be a shout. Sometimes you're going to have to have a strategy while they're talking about you, while they're lying on you, while they're dragging your name through the mud. Tell your neighbor, I don't mind them dragging my name in the mud because I chose to get down there on purpose. You can drag my name through the mud. I'm just going to crawl through the, the mud and find my name and make it great again. Somebody shout, have a strategy. This is the only point. I'm not even getting to the other points. I'm just going to stay on strategy. God made sure David had a strategy because God knows it's dangerous to give somebody authority if they don't have a strategy. Okay. How many of you want to open your own business? Okay. Step one. I wait. Because wanting to start a business is not a strategy. Number one, go hold the name so nobody can take it from you. Or go make sure that the company you want to name 
it's not already used by somebody else, so you're not sued for infringement. And that costs $16. You'll have a million dollar lawsuit because you didn't spend $16 to DBA something. Next, find your customer and stop starting businesses that you like. Start businesses that customers like. Everybody don't want cookies. I'm gonna start a bakery. Cause I like to bake and everybody being vegans now. And everybody's coming off sugar and you starting a, a sugar cookie company when everybody's talking about no sugar. I can't do that kind of business cause, because I just don't have passion for it. I don't enjoy it. I can't do nothing I don't enjoy. I told you before, you better stop starting businesses that you enjoy because the man who invented the casket, I know he didn't want to enjoy it. You better find out what people want and start a business about that. And you might not enjoy the business, but enjoy going to the bank. Touch your name and say, I'm going to enjoy going down to that bank. I want to be on first name basis with everybody in there. I want the security guard to see me come and say, hey, Mr. Henderson, how you doing? I'm here again, sir. <laughs> business is good. <laughs> everybody say strategy. Who am I helping? I know I'm boring some of y'all, but who am I helping? Because I only need 100 of y'all. If I can get 100 of y'all to get a strategy, I can show 100 of y'all how to take care of your family for the rest of their life, not the rest of your life. He took advice from somebody to have a strategy. The next part of your strategy is to stop taking advice from people who don't have a strategy. Stop taking advice from people just because they're your friend. And do you know that sometimes you can be partially successful without a strategy? You, listen, don't mistake, that's because you see somebody with a business and all that kind of stuff on Instagram, that don't mean they're doing nothing. <clears throat> How many of y'all ever watch Sports Center? Raise your hand. It looked like they don't never miss a shot on Sports Center. Because all they do is show the highlights. That's all Instagram is. It's everybody's highlights, but they ain't show you the bricks, the turnovers, the... They ain't show you the missed opportunities. They don't show you the pink slip. They don't show you the red notice on the door. They don't show you that they one month away from losing their apartment. Don't get fooled by the highlights. They can have 100,000 followers on Instagram and no gas money. You pick what you want. I'd rather have no Instagram and put gas in my car than many around here time I look how many followers. You can't cash followers. There's some people in here right now got plenty of money. You don't even, they ain't got no Facebook account. And there's other people on here drinking mimosas and having cranberries in their water. They ain't got nothing. I'm, talking about, I'm at the beach in, in uh, Nairobi having a good time, but they ain't tell you that they done had to get five girlfriends and share one room. Now, they didn't went and sat on somebody else's car that took a picture to make you think they in it. That ain't theirs. I hope y'all getting mad because you don't need to floss, you need a strategy. You need to stop pretending and get a strategy. So the next time you buy the hotel, the next time you take the vacation, it'll be real and not false humility. I'm just trying to help. Who are my sons and daughters? I'm only talking to my members right now. All y'all church goers, you can go to sleep. I'm talking to my members right now. I ain't talking about people who came to church today. I'm talking about people who passed I am. And I know that ain't everybody in the room. God will never work a miracle where you ought to use your mind. Slap your neighbor and say, think. Sometimes he'll give a miracle, other times he requires your mind. You need a strategy. They talking about him. You ain't ever going to get in here because sometimes you got to do your strategy while they're hating on you. Don't ever stop your strategy because you have naysayers. Get to verse 8 and 9. Here's what the Bible says, my favorite word, nevertheless. 
which meant that David was saying, I don't care what y'all say, I'm still getting in there. I don't care what y'all have to say, I'm still coming. Slap somebody and say, I don't care what they say, I'm still going to do it. I don't care how I grew up, I'm still going to accomplish it. I don't care how broke I am, I'm still going to be rich. Don't look at your situation and think that your situation speaks to your future. You speak to your future, say, here I come, here I come, here I come. David says, I, ain't, I don't have to be the smartest person in the room. Can anybody help me? I don't have to get all the credit. Is there anybody in here who has a strategy? Because if you have a good strategy, I'll use it. Most problem with most people is that the only strategy they will adopt is the one they came up with. But sometimes you got to open up your mind. You got to get out of having a wide view through a narrow window. What good is it to see broad if you're looking through a scope? Say, can anybody help me? Anybody? You come up with a strategy, I'll promote you. Who have you promoted in your life lately? Or is everybody still on the same level in your life as the day they met you? Oh, God, help me in this place. See, some of y'all have never, ever thought to promote people in your life. You got to have friends, but then you got to have confidants. And see, most people in your life, they are loyal, and they are same, on the same level as the folk that just walked in. You got to differentiate people in your life. You got to give certain people perks. You got to invite certain people in the rooms. When somebody has been loyal to you, you got to show them doors that you don't show everybody else. I got a couple of people in my life right now, I looked at them just because of their loyalty and said, just because of your loyalty, I'm going to make you rich. Just make you rich. You don't deserve to be in a room. The people in the room don't know you. The people in the room wouldn't invite you, but you're going to come in with me because somebody let me in. You got to be careful who you take in that room with you, though, because they'll get in that room and stab you and then pretend like they got you there. And You got to be careful who you connect with your connections because the people you connect with your connections will try to disconnect you and take your connection. And that's all a part of my strategy. Who's going to watch the watcher? You got somebody watching out for you, but then you're going to have to hire somebody to watch the person that's watching you. Lord, I'm trying to help somebody. I don't know who I'm helping. Somebody say, nevertheless. The Bible says, nevertheless. That joker coming there, he said, I don't care what y'all say about me. I don't care if you don't think I'm qualified. I'm still going to be king. And he walked in there, and the Bible says he does two things. <laughs> now, now don't, the Bible say this. Don't y'all start judging me. The Bible says that David took on more wives and more concubines. That's what the book. Talking about what? Read your Bible. I ain't say it. It's in there. Read it when you get home. He said he took on more wives, more concubines. <clears throat> he got him some more women. And went there. And, and, and then the next thing he did is the Bible says he built a house at the stronghold. Oh, David, thank you. You showed me what you got to do to make ends meet. He builds a house, and he has 15 more children, which means that in the face of the people who are telling him he's not good enough, he produces and builds. The, the two things you're going to have to do is produce and build no matter what's going on in your life. They can be scrutinizing you. They can tell you you're not anointed. They can tell you you don't deserve it but prove to them and God and yourself that you do by being able to produce and build in an unproductive environment. Can you produce and build when nobody believes in you? Or do you need everybody's encouragement to get out of the bed in the morning? If somebody don't call you, you think the relationship is over. They didn't call me, so it must mean they don't love me. Some of us are so dependent on pats on the back that you can never go to the next level because the moment somebody stops encouraging, you get discouraged and quit. Sometimes you got to get out of the bed and encourage yourself in the Lord. Sometimes you got to pat your own self on the back. 
Sometimes you got to say, you know what, self, I am more than enough. I am beautiful. I am strong. I am called. I am, I am, I am powerful. Come on, spend the next 13 seconds just speaking to yourself. You always speaking into somebody else's life and nobody ever speaks into your life. Just start speaking into yourself. Come on, somebody speaking to yourself right now. I am the head and not the tail. I'm going to overcome. I'm going to establish the stronghold. I'm going to produce and I'm going to build no matter what situation I'm in. I got more sermon, but I'm done. I want you to develop a strategy this year. This might not be in the most exciting sermon, but I tell you right now, I guarantee you, whoever gets this tape and listens to this sermon over and over again and develops a strategy, you will surpass every person in here who's waiting on a miracle. I don't know how bad you want what you're asking for, but God never gives a miracle where a mind will do. Only reason why he turned water to wine is because you can't do that with your mind. But I tell you what, when he healed the man who had the lame legs on the bed, he healed his legs, but he did not pick him up off the ground. He healed his legs. He says, now get up, pick up your bed and walk because I will not do for you what you can do for yourself. And I'm afraid that some of you all are still laying on the ground, on your bed, waiting on God to pick you up. And God says, I already put the power in your legs. I'm not going to pick you up, but I've given you the power to stand up. I want you to stand up in your dreams. I want you to stand up and fight. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Give somebody who looks like they got fire in their eyes and say, this year invade it. This year take it. This year stand up on your own. This year open the door. This year break the ceiling. This year start the company. This year open the business, but you're not going to do it without a strategy. Jesus had a strategy. Okay, I'm going to leave heaven. I'm going to come to earth. I'm going to find a virgin. I'm going to go in her womb. Stay there nine months. I'm going to get out. I'm going to get circumcised on the earth day. And after that, I'm going to lay low. Then at 12, I'm going to reappear. After that, I'm going to lay low. I ain't going to let them see me again until I'm 30. I'm going to do carpentry work in the meantime to throw them off. And then at 30, I'm going to show up. See, what, what are you doing to throw the enemy off? You got to get the enemy off your scent. You see, sometimes you have to put mustard on the dog's nose so he can't follow you. Then he shows up at 30 and says, all right, for three years, I'm going to wear him out. Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And then at 33, I'm going to let them think they killed me. Now I'm going to let them put me in the tomb. But here's my strategy. I'm going to get up on the third day morning. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, you believe also in me. For in my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you and bring you unto myself that where I am. That's the strategy. I'm coming back one day for a church without spot or wrinkle. And I'm not coming back looking for perfect people. I'm looking for people who will go in the gutter so that I can wash them with my blood and make them white as snow. And I'm going to get 12 disciples, and then I'm going to send them out two by two and tell them to establish the church two by two so that in 2018 there can be billions of Christians all around the world. That's my strategy. And my strategy is when the dead in Christ... They will rise, and then those who are alive will be caught up in the twinkling of an eye. I'll do it so fast they won't even see it coming. That's my strategy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hang between two thieves and prove my, I'm going to prove my strategy. I'm going to hang between two thieves, and I'm going to let one of them think he can make it in on his own, and I'm going to have the other one say, remember me when you come into your kingdom, and then I'm going to tell him, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise so that people can see that you don't have to be baptized to go to heaven, that all you got to do is confess with your mouth. That's my strategy. What's your strategy? 
And who are the 12 people at your table that will establish your strategy when you have to do your next job? I tell people this all the time. The problem with being your company's brand, you, is that it can never grow because if you have to be there for everything, you've already relegated it to average at best. When this church started and I was doing everything, we had hundreds of members. I had to pull back and let some other people do things. I lost hundreds of members because the hundreds that I lost were accustomed to me being at everything. But God sent thousands to replace the people who needed me to do my old job in a new season. I never thought when we started this church that everybody who started with us would be here at the end. I've been a pastor for too long to be that naive.